lights up on a bedroom. The lights are dim. Two beds lie in the middle of the stage. The room is full of typical teenage room decor. Two bean bags, a few piles of clothes, cups and water bottles hoarded yet organized on bedside table, and a desk with a large old looking computer on it. We see a lump on one of the beds. There lies a figure sleeping soundly. In front of the bed, the computer screen is on and we hear the click clacking of a keyboard. Jada slurping a Coca-Cola and typing a mile a minute on a computer PC releases a loud aggravated groan when the lights on the computer screen abruptly shut off. She takes her headphones off and begins to hit the computer screen with her palm. Ugh! Shut up! Jada does not pay attention to her sister, instead gets up from the desk and proceeds to turn on the light, turn the bedroom lights on. The lights on the stage get brighter. Hey, Jay, what the fuck? Just shut up or you'll wake him up. You know how he gets when you do that. Bray pulls a red stuffed bear from underneath the, her pillow and uses it to cover her face. She groans into it. Jada ignores her sister's exclamations and walks back to the computer and starts opening the console. She searches the desk for a screwdriver, but doesn't find it. She turns to her sister, annoyed. Where the hell is my screwdriver, Bray? Uh, how am I supposed to know? It's your screwdriver. I don't have time for games, Bray. I was in the middle of... Something incredibly revolutionary. Yes, the Lotus is incredibly revolutionary. Or at least it will be once I finish it. You say that every night, Jay. Just because you had a few prizes in school for your stupid computer shit doesn't make you a genius. Your screwdriver's on the floor next to the beanbag. Jada walks to the beanbag, silently picks up the screwdriver, and starts unscrewing pieces of the computer. You know, I didn't mean it like that. Just shut up, Bray. Jada continues to work on the computer. Bray pulls out a magazine from underneath her bed and starts reading. After a few moments of messing around with it, Jada closes up the console and computer, and the light on the screen turns back on. She smiles and walks to the wall and turns the lights back off, the lights on stage dim. Are you blind? I'm trying to read. I was actually getting to a really interesting part. Yes, because Cosmopolitan is such an engrossing and enthralling read. Hey, it actually is. This entry is called How Bitches Get Riches. It's very entrepreneurial of them, if I do say so myself. <laughs> we have to be quiet. All this computer shit you're doing, what's it called? Logos? It better bring in money one day. It's a program, not computer shit, and it's called Lotus. Get it right. And it will. Bring in money? Yes. Jada goes back to typing a mile a minute on the computer. We hear the clacking as the lights black out on stage. Lights up. A few hours have passed. Jada sleeps with her head on the computer keyboard. Bray is asleep in her bed. The lights on stage turn on. A loud door slam echoes off stage. The girls both abruptly wake up. Moments later, Rick, their stepfather, stumbles into the room. He is drunk. Good morning, ladies. Rick? It's 4 a.m., Rick. Please just let us go back to bed. No. Rick makes his way to Bray and pulls her by the hair, trying to drag her out of bed. Jada rushes over and tries to push Rick away. Leave her alone, Rick. Don't touch her. Bray screams as they scuffle around. Jada grabs Rick's arm and pushes him off Bray. He turns around and punches Jada in the eye. He turns back to Bray. Just, please, just don't hurt her. I'll, I'll. Hey, don't. I'll, I'll go to your room with you. At a girl. He grabs Jada by the arm, leading her out of the room. Jada turns back to a whimpering Bray. Hey, hey, stop crying. I'll be fine. I'll meet you at the normal spot when you're done with school. Rick drags Jada out of the room. Bray grabs 
her red bear, gets out of her bed and gets into Jada's bed. Lights out. Lights up. Jada leans against a gate in front of a high school. She is smoking a cigarette and wearing a baseball hat covered low on her left side to hide her black eye. The bell rings and kids file out. Ray spots Jada and rushes to her. They hold each other for a moment. Did he? Yeah, but I'm fine. You, you can't take it anymore. I know. He, how's your head? He pulled pretty tight. It's okay. A bit sore. I thought it would be like mom's or something, but really it's nothing major. I'm serious, Jay. You, you can't- I said I'm fine. Drop it, please. Okay, but you know you can talk to me? I'm here, Jay. You know, I heard something interesting in the cafeteria today. Yeah? Ray takes a cigarette out of Jada's mouth, takes a hit, then crushes it under her shoe. Hey! <coughs> Smoking kills. Anyways, so apparently there's like this major computer super virus that keeps attacking all these huge ass companies around the world. It deletes their files and then like hacks into the important shit that companies like to keep secret. It's apparently a really big deal. A bunch of CEOs are freaking out about it. All the major news stations keep reporting about it. Maya told me that Mr. Dominguez- Wait, wait, wait. The one that we always see at the corner church bake sales? Yes, him. He was fired yesterday after he got all of his company's data wiped. <laughs> apparently, he opened one of those super virus emails and it all went to shit. <laughs> uh, Maya said, Mr. Dominguez thought he was clicking on a link that would lead him to see free porn, but <laughs> instead, you know, he got hacked. We had a huge laugh about it at lunch. Like, of course, this would happen to Mr. Dominguez, the guy who was always yelling, God sees all, hears all, knows all. <laughs> it's funny that the same guy who would always talk your ear off about heaven and force you to buy a churro from the church bake sale is literally trying to watch porn at work. <laughs> These hackers are so rude though. Apparently the virus shut down his computer before the site could even load. Like, I mean, the least it could have done was shown the poor guy some naked woman before causing him to lose his job. <laughs> um, have they found a cure for the virus? Not yet. Apparently, according to Macy, they have all these super nerds from like Harvard and Yale who have like already cured cancer or something working on it. You need to stop getting your information from Maya and Macy. No one has cured cancer yet. Jada brings earbuds and a mini radio out of her back pocket and puts one earbud in. Shut up, they're my girls. Hey, you know what? What? I bet you could do it. Do what? Make some smart, insane computer thing that stops this crazy super virus. You know what? The Lotus could hypothetically be modified to handle a hack like that. I need to do some research first though. Let's go to the library then. You can do your research and I can hang out with Jude. He's 30, right? I know. Plus it gives us a reason to stay away from home. Jada pulls Bray in and holds her as they walk off stage. You know, I would tell you if I wasn't okay. Everything I do, I do for you. That's what mom would want. I know. Lights out. Lights up and are dim as the set changes to the inside of a public library. It's run down as a library in a poorer neighborhood often is. There are two homeless men sleeping on a desk a couple of people milling around different areas of the library. Two out of the three computers are occupied. The one on the left taken by a young Hispanic boy in a collarless dress shirt and slacks. He is wearing headphones. 
The one on the right is taken by an elderly woman. The middle computer is left open. Bray and Jada enter the stage and walk to the man behind a counter at the front of the library. Hey, dude. Brianna. You don't look too happy to see your favorite library goer. <laughs> <laughs> Brianna, in all my years of working here, you have never once checked out a book from this library. You just leave through the Cosmopolitan and periodically apply lip gloss. I don't think it would be fair to call you my favorite library goer. <laughs> You say that like it's a bad thing. Cosmo is actually very enlightening. Jude picks this up a book from underneath in. the counter and hands it. This just came in, Jada. I thought you would like it. He hands the book to Jada. Jada raises her head for a sec, and Jude stares at her black eye. What happened to your- Secret life of programs. Thanks, Jude. I've been waiting on this one. And why don't you ever save me any books, Jude? You're asking me a question you already know the answer to, young lady. Hey. OK, oh. I'm going to head over to the computers now. You two play nice. Jada puts the book Jude gave her into Bray's backpack and heads over to the computers. Jada accidentally bumps into the chair of one of the sleeping homeless men as she walks to the computers. He wakes up, looks at her. She whispers an apologetic, Sorry. She sits down and is about to turn on the computer when the old lady to her right whispers to her. Oh, that computer doesn't work, my dear. Jada turns on the computer and the computer makes a weird noise. The screen goes white for a second, then abruptly turns off. Looks like a console problem. This is a weird question, but do you have a screwdriver? The old woman shakes her head no. But the sleeping homeless man she just bumped into sits up straight and digs into his pockets. Here. He throws her a screwdriver. Jada catches it. Thanks, man. She opens up the computer with the screwdriver and starts messing around with the hard drive and mainframe of the computer. She works for a few moments. The old woman watches her intently. The Hispanic boy tries to look like he's not paying attention, but he glances over every so often to see what Jada is doing. After taking a few moments to fix the internal components of the computer, Jada turns the computer back on and everything starts working properly. She tosses the, the screwdriver back to the homeless guy and sits down. The Hispanic boy turns and stares at her. Um, do you need something? If you're wondering about my black eye, then mind your fucking business. You didn't have to take the whole console apart to fix the computer. I know. So why'd you do it? It would have been easier to just- Just move the modem and put the NIC next to the video chip. I know. How'd you know? You're gonna say that? <laughs> because all programmers think like you. I mean, just look at you. You work at Pell Industries. I can tell by the required all-natural collarless dress shirt. I was going to intern there last summer. So why didn't you? Intern? Yeah. Because I want to create. All you guys focus on is doing the same thing over and over, working on the same CPU, recreating the same zip card. Your motherboards literally haven't changed in over eight years. You guys don't care about innovation, creating new technologies, or advancing what is possible and making new possibilities. Look. Yes, I could have moved the modem and done the same thing that everyone does to the NIC, but that wouldn't have improved the computer. It would have made it do exactly what it did before. Now though, because I took apart the motherboards and actually played around with it, the computer works 10 times faster and I can now program a code on it that will stop it from arbitrarily shutting down like that ever again. What? Are you gonna say something or just keep staring at me like some creep? I'm impressed. And so I don't need or want validation from a complete stranger. I know. Bray stomps over, interrupting them. She is pouty. Jay, let's go. Jude is being so mean. Can you believe it? He told me that he has a fiance or whatever. I mean, how rude is that? First, 
he flirts with you and barely acknowledges me. And then he tells me some romantic story about how he proposed to love this life on some stupid swing set that they met at when they were children. I mean, how selfish can you be? That is so rude, isn't it? She turns to Mitchell. You agree, right? That's so rude, yeah? Like, so rude. <laughs> and who are you? Uh, Mitchell, but my friends call me Mitch. He holds out a hand for Bray to shake. She looks at it, then rolls her eyes. Can we please leave, Jay? Of course we can. Jada gets up and starts heading out. Mitchell jogs after her. She catches up, he catches up to her at the checkout counter. Hey, please wait. Jada and Bray both turn around. I think everything you said back there was incredibly cool. He grabs a piece of paper and a pencil from the counter and writes something. Talk to me sometime. I'd love to pick your brain about some stuff. Jada begrudgingly takes the paper. Bray peeks over her shoulder and reads what the paper says. How is she supposed to talk to you? You don't even write down a phone number. This better not be a link to one of those computer super virus things. It's a blog. It's a blog with chat function. I programmed it myself. She can message me on there. Okay, nerds. Message me, please. I'll think about it. Mitchell nods and heads back to the computers. Bray watches him. I mean, I guess he's actually quite cute in a nerdy way. You know, I don't see many Hispanic boys doing the whole computer thing. And then again, you don't see many black girls doing it either. You know what? You two would be perfect for each other. Shut up. Jude walks up to the girls with a box of books in hand. No, you talking to Mitch. He's a good guy. Really smart kid. You know, he got to Yale, but declined his offer of admission. Why? He wanted to stay close to home. Why would anyone in their right mind skip out on a chance to go to Yale? It's a personal story, is to tell. Interesting. Well, thanks again for the book, Jude. See you, see you around? Owen, congrats on the engagement. We are so happy for you. Thank you. You are so dead. Lights out. lights up. The stage should be set up in such a way that one half of the stage can be lit while the other side is dark. There should be a projector shining off the back wall of the stage. This is where their messages will pop up. On the left side of the stage, Jada and Bray's room. On the right, a boy's room, bare, not many things in it, unpersonalized, a bed, a desk with a newer looking computer on it, and a bedside table will suffice. It is very minimal. It is nighttime. Lights up on the left side of the stage. Jada and Bray are lying on their beds. Jada holds Mitchell's paper in her hand. She looks at it and sighs. Bray watches her with her red stuffed bear in her arms, but doesn't say anything. Jada looks at the paper for a minute, then crumples it up and throws it into the mess that is their shared room. I know you did not just do that. He is irrelevant and annoying and- So obviously into you. Whatever. I don't have time to entertain guys anyway. You literally do though. I don't. You do have time. Jay, you don't do anything. What are you talking about? I do do things. Like what? Those community college classes. And when was the last time you actually went to one of those classes? You think I don't notice? I notice everything about you, Jay. You're my sister, my best friend. I see everything. I know you haven't been going to your classes. I've been waiting uh, five weeks now for you to tell me why. You don't go to class. You never hang out with your random computer friends from the summer. All you do is just mess around on the computer all day. Why? Because. Because why? Because I want to. Jay, please tell me the truth. I'm here for you. Let me in. Let me help you. 
Rick stopped paying for the classes a few weeks ago. And all my computer friends were just competitive assholes who brought me into the group to see the freak show that I am. A poor black girl from the hood trying to fix and advance technologies that are too complex for even people with Ivy League college degrees to understand. They brought me in to make fun of me. And I never told you because it's embarrassing. Plus, I'm the big sister. I'm supposed to be strong and it's me that's supposed to protect you, not the other way around. You didn't need to know those things, so I didn't tell you about them. Jay, I'm fine, Ray. Ray gets out of her bed and gets in bed with her sister. You don't have to carry your problems alone. You can tell me things. I'm a lot more mature than I act. I know. He stopped paying for my classes because one night I told him that once I finished the Lotus, me and you are going to leave and never come back. And of course that pissed him off. Why did you say that? I don't know. I guess I was just so tired of, well, everything. This life we're living, right? It's not normal for two teenage girls to live like we do. It's not normal for Rick to do the things he does. I, I'm just so tired of it. Then change it. Get us out of here. Finish the Lotus and then we can move on and never look back. I know, I'm trying. Can we just forget about this whole conversation? I just don't wanna feel bad right now. Of course. You should message the guy. <sighs> Get your mind off things? Besides, what's the worst that could happen? Jada lets out a deep sigh. She sits on the bed thinking for a moment. She then gets up and goes to the computer. Ray points at the crumpled piece of paper that Jada has previously thrown. Aren't you going to need that? Nope, I memorized it. <laughs> of course you did. Lights shut off on Jada and Bray. The right side of the stage lights up on Mitchell's room. He is sitting at his computer typing. The sound of a message dings on his computer. On the big screen, on the back of the stage, a message pops up. Hey. Hey. I like your blog. The layout is a little too rudimentary for me. My taste, though. Is that how you treat your host? I let you into my home and you judge it? I'm not mocking it. I'm simply just informing you that I hate it. So what do you recommend I do to make it better? Use this code I created. It's called JScript. It has a shit ton of fonts, lettering, colors, and sizes. You can even add images on it. I knew you were talented, but that is a whole different level. Applesauce. Applesauce. Oh, typo. Applause. <laughs> I like applesauce much better. <laughs> Want to play a game? Sure. Pac-Man? Pac-Man can't be played on two separate servers yet. You underestimate me. You're telling me that you created a version of, a version of Pac-Man that people can play on different servers? No, I didn't just create a new version of Pac-Man. I used the Pac-Man's actual mainframe so it looks exactly like you're playing it on the actual Pac-Man gaming system. You're lying. Click the link. Mitchell clicks on the link and his jaw drops. Close your mouth before a fly flies in. How did you know my jaw dropped? I swear you're magic. <laughs> it was a guess, <laughs> but maybe I am magic. I literally wouldn't be surprised. You amaze me. Let's play. Wait. Before we begin, tell me your name. I know your sister calls you Jay, but you've never told me your full name. Jada, but my sister, who is my only friend, calls me Jay. Well, nice to meet you, Jada. Let's play. The big screen lights up with a game of Pac-Man. Lights completely black out for a moment, then lights up on Jada and Bray's room. Jada lets out a loud, yes because she has just beaten Mitchell and Pac-Man for the third time. Jesus, Jay, how long are you guys gonna do this for? 
You played like 13 games already. Shut up. You've only played three games. So are you going to ask him about the whole Yale thing? What? No, Jude said it was personal. But <laughs> I'm so curious. And you'll stay curious because I don't want to pry into this guy's life. Imagine someone you just met asking about mom or about Trish. Hey, do not bring Trish into this. She is my drunk alter ego, and whatever she does, I do not claim. Yeah, so how would you feel if someone asked about the time Trish stole some random guy's car and accidentally drove into a ditch? Fair. You have to res respect people's privacy. It's just so rude to just go... Jid is interrupted by the ding on her computer. On her screen, the message from Mitchell. You told me that your sister told him that you don't go to your community college classes anymore. Uh, why? <laughs> I guess he doesn't respect your privacy. <laughs> you told Jude? Oops. Well, I may have asked him if he had seen you at the library on Mondays through Thursdays from the hours of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. He said yes. He'd seen you there at those times a couple of times. I told him my theory that you dropped out of school. <laughs> Bray! Sorry. Jada turns to her computer and thinks for a second, then replies. I'll tell you if you tell me why you didn't go to Yale. Lights down on Jada and Bray. Lights up on Mitchell. He sits there, looking at his computer screen. He doesn't move. After a while, he gets up and sits on his bed. He puts his head in his arms. He sits like that in that position for a while. Then he gets up, sits back at his computer. He types. It's personal. Mine too. I'll tell you someday, but we just met, you know? I know. Bye. Lights up on Jada. She stares at the screen for a second. Then she gets up and tucks herself into bed. Bray oblivious to the messages just shared, picks up a brush and brushes her hair for a moment. She puts it down. Rick isn't back yet. You think he fell into a sewer or something while trying to drunkenly stumble back here? I hope so. And I hope your eye gets better. It took about three weeks to heal last time. So it'll probably take three weeks to get better this time too. Lights out. Lights up on the library. Jada walks in, no trace of a black eye. It has been a little over three weeks since we last saw her. Jude is not there. It's a woman named Erin today. Jada has come in many times in the past three weeks. She knows Erin cordially. She waves at Erin. Erin waves back. Jada sits at the computer. Aaron walks by, putting books away. People come in and out of the library. Every so often, the lights in the theater should get dimmer, increasingly getting darker, showing the passage of time, as Jada sits in the library all day. Jada can get up from the computer a few times and leaf through books, maybe play a game on the computer, talk to one of the homeless people that are always in the library. Eventually, Aaron approaches her. Hey. We're closing in an hour. I know. I feel like you've been here every day for the past month. Uh, are you sure there isn't anything I can help you with? No, I'm fine. Thank you. All right. Aaron walks back to the checkout desk. Jada intently watches the door for a few moments. Then she gives up and gets up. She is starting to leave when the door opens. Mitchell walks in with a box of books. Hey. Aaron, you told me to leave all... Oh, hey. He sets the books down on the counter. Hey, I, I was just leaving. Jada walks around him and heads for the door. Mitchell turns and grabs her arm. J Jada, I haven't seen or heard from you in over a week, and you're just going to run out on me? Yes. Just get lunch with me. No. Please? No? Fine. Lights out. Lights up.
Jada sits alone on a bench in a park. Mitchell walks on stage with a hot dog in each hand. He screams, thanks again, see you to an off stage person. Mitchell hands Jada a hot dog, then begins to eat his while Jada is holding hers. Your dog is gonna get cold. It's delicious, I promise. Randy's is the best hot dog stand in the state. Jada takes a tentative bite, then another bigger one. She enjoys it. So why'd you ghost me? You really left me hanging there. We spent many wonderful virtual weeks together and then out of, the, out of nowhere, you stopped getting on the blog. I even revamped it using your J script and it made hella nice. I know, I have been keeping up with updates. I really like what you've done to it. So why? I thought we were good. And then all of a sudden, one day I never saw or heard from you again. People hurt other people, Mitchell. I know. I've been there multiple times. The easiest way to never get hurt is to never let anyone in. That's a terrible way of looking at life. Well, that's how I see it. But you're only looking at one half of it, Jada. Yeah, sure, life is bad and people hurt you sometimes. But life is also good, and the good will always outweigh the bad. It's... I just don't want to be your friend, okay? This is stupid. Jada gets up and starts walking away from Mitchell. Jude and Aaron tell me that you come into the library every day. They say that you sometimes just stare at the door like you're waiting for someone. Who have you been waiting for? Tell me that, that it's not me, and, and I'll leave you alone. Jada is silent. She does not look at Mitchell. Mitchell gets up and stands next to her. Jada is facing the audience. Mitchell is behind her, looking at her. You've been waiting for me. I know you have, Jada. And I would have come back to the library sooner, but they've been running my ass at work. I'm the... I'm there till midnight practically every single night. And I'm the only non-white guy there. So it feels like I have to prove myself even more. I have to prove that I'm just as smart, as, as capable, as worthy as the other guys. I've been doing everything I can to prove myself over there. That's why I haven't come into the library until today. But if you would have reached out, I would have dropped everything at work to see you. I've never felt as comfortable and as stupid as I have when I'm with you. You make me feel like I should be doing more than I am. Your constant desire to improve, create, and generate new technologies is like unlike anything I've ever seen. I stay up late at night experimenting and, and thinking because of you. I'm a happier person, a smarter person, and a better person when I'm with you even if it is just virtually. I... Mitchell moves closer to her and embraces her. At first, Jada is rigid and she doesn't return the hug. Then slowly, she lets herself droop into his arms. She hugs him back. They stand, in, they stand there in each other's arms for a moment. Then Jada whispers to him. My stepdad, Frank, hurts me. He... I pretend to be strong so that my sister doesn't know, see how much it actually breaks me every time he puts his hands on me. Mitchell takes a few steps back, then motions to the park bench. They both sit. They are silent for a long moment. My mom killed herself when I was 13. I found her lying on the bathroom floor. Until that moment, everything that day was so normal. We had just got back from getting toys at Goodwill, a red stuff bear for Bray and a toy computer for me. Those were the last two gifts we would ever get from our mother. Imagine how shocking it was going to the bathroom and seeing my mom in a pool of blood. I was so confused, not just because there was blood everywhere, but also because she was wearing her favorite white dress, polished white heels and bright red lipstick. She looked beautiful and regal. It was almost mesmerizing. 
But then Bryce started crying in the other room. And it was like I snapped out of a trance and I really looked at her. And suddenly I saw the bruises on her arms and legs. I saw her busted lip underneath the lipstick. I saw the bald spot in her hair from the time Rick pulled so hard it literally ripped out. I saw the cracks in the fine china that was once my mother. Jade. It was, it was like a, she was a puzzle. And my stepdad had torn her puzzle apart. And for years, she tried so hard to fix her puzzle, but every time she got close, he would come back and ruin the whole thing again. And after a while, I think she forgot what her puzzle was supposed to look like. And, and she tried her best to put herself back together one last time. But all those pieces were in the wrong place and the puzzle didn't make sense. And so she was left with a puzzle that she didn't recognize. A puzzle that she was ashamed of, a puzzle she didn't think she could ever fix. So she destroyed it. She destroyed it herself to make sure that he would never be able to ruin her again. And you know what? Of all the ways she could have done it, of all the ways she could have ended her life, she chose the messiest way. I think it was despite my stepdad because he would beat her every day as soon as he came home. He'd always scream that the house wasn't clean even when she spent the whole day scrubbing every single surface in that home until it shined. He would beat her senseless. So I assumed the messiness of the blood was supposed to be one last fuck you to him. The blood stains never came out and we were evicted and moved to a tiny apartment. Ever since her death, the only two things that I've known have been my sister and my computer. They never let me down because they're my family. When I realized that I liked you, I froze. I stopped talking to you because I didn't want you to ruin my puzzle like Rick did to my mom's. I have absolutely no interest in ruining your puzzle, Jada. I want to add to it. I want to make everything better. I want to do whatever I can to help make you better. I would never do the things that Rick has done. I am not him and I never will be. I promise to treat you better than that because quite honestly, you are the most amazing thing in the world to me. And I... Jada leans into Mitchell and kisses him. Lights out. Lights up on Jada and Bray's room. Bray's on her bed with her red bear in hand, flipping through a magazine. Time has passed. Mitchell is sitting on the corner of Jada's bed, watching Jada type a mile a minute on her computer. Unlike previous times, her computer looks different. Her console is much newer, sleeker. Every so often, Mitchell gets up and paces around the room, then sits back down on the bed. Mitch, stop pacing. You're making me anxious. I'm nervous. We are all nervous. I mean, what if this code that you and Jay, well, mostly Jay, have been working on for the past few months doesn't work? The Lotus, her dream, her baby, our ticket out of here, the literal solution to the super virus? Essentially, her entire life for the past- like Shut up. Jay, don't listen to her. You were so brilliant Both of and- you, shut up. I need quiet. Hey, I'm just trying to be the voice of reason. Everyone needs a- uh... What? Oh, what's wrong? It's done. Let me see. Mitchell rushes over to her computer screen and stares at the screen. Then he turns to Jada and kisses her. You did it, Jay. You, you fucking did it. We did it. I couldn't have done it without you guys. Mitch, without the new computer and programming chips, I could never have gotten any of this done in such a short amount of time. And Bray, well, you definitely brought me snacks when I was working. So thanks for that, I guess. That was very helpful. Okay, you make it seem like the only thing I did all these months is make you snacks. I also brought you waters and Cokes too. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, now hurry, Mitch. You need to take this code to your boss. This is the moment we've been waiting for. Every day, man, every fucking day, you never cease to amaze me. This is all you, with just a little 
bit of help from me and no help, Brea. Yeah, and by help, you mean stealing her an old console from your job. That was really something, Mitch. <laughs> Shut up, Brea. Let me have my moment. <laughs> Jada gets up and pulls the pulls out a drive from the computer. She hands it to Mitchell, and then she starts pushing him out of the room. Okay, now go. Get the drive to your boss and tell him we all helped make the drive. I don't want all the recognition. Say something... Say that me, you, and even Bray coded the cure together as a team. We'll see you at the hotel later this evening. Mitchell turns around and gives Jada one last kiss before dashing off stage. As per usual, I am so proud of you, Jay. Jada walks over to her sister and hugs her. Now pack up. Let's get out of here before- A crash interrupts her. Rick smashes on stage. Well, what do we have here? Now, how did you afford this fancy new computer? You've been stealing from me, haven't you? No, we haven't. It was a gift. Rick, we've been over this. My friend gifted us this a computer. A gift? Yes, like, like I've said before, a gift. You think you can fool me? Rick laughs and charges after the girls. <laughs> Jada gets in front of her sister and Rick begins to punch her. Bray screams. Jada tries to fight back. Bray stands there in shock. And without hesitation, she runs to the computer, picks up the console. The stage goes black. There is a loud crashing sound, then a loud thump. When the lights come back on, Rick is lying on the ground with a pool of blood surrounding him. Bray and Jada stare at his unmoving body. Then, without a word, they run. Lights out. Lights up on a standard office space. Desks with computers, like the one Jada had in her room, are on them. A few men are in the office. All are white. They all wear the same colorless dress shirt as Mitchell. When he rushes in, they all turn to look at him. Hey. No one responds. Mitchell shrugs it off and goes to his desk. He puts the drive in and waits for a second. There are donuts in the break room. Oh, th thanks, man. Mitchell gets up and walks out of the office briefly. He enters back a few moments later with a donut from the break room. He sees someone standing over his desk. It's his boss, Hugo. He is with three other men. Is, is this what I think this is, Mitch? Yes, sir. I was actually just about to come to your office and... <laughs> well, I'll be damned. I guess you Mexicans are worth something. This is great stuff. <laughs> well, actually, sir, I'm from El Salvador. El Salvador. I'm not oh, Mexican. It, it, it's all the same, son. It really isn't. You know, I've put up with a lot of bullshit in my past year here. I'm proud of where I'm from, so please, get it right. I don't know who the hell you're talking to, boy. If I were you, I would tread lightly. There are cameras all over this building. So if someone were to, say, steal one of the other company's new, expensive, grade-A PCs, I would know. <laughs> there will be a press conference in an hour. You will talk about how you created the code right here in this very office using our company's machinery. You will not mention any external help. You will not credit anyone, but this company is the reason for your success. Do this and the police won't hear about your little stealing problem. Unless you want to face 10 years in prison, I do as I say, boy. Hugo takes the drive from the computer and walks out. The three men follow him. Mitchell stands there, lights out. Lights up, 
The stage is again cut in half. On one half, Bray and Jada sit in a hotel room. They stare at a TV in front of them. On the other half of the stage, Mitchell stands there with his boss and news reporters surrounding him. The thing, the things that are happening to Mitchell on one side of the stage are being broadcast to Jada and Bray on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, be prepared to never forget the name Mitchell Ramon. He will be a household name. This young man has single-handedly cured the most pressing, most complex technical problem of this generation. He, a 22-year-old immigrant from El Salvador, has done what no one else could do. The very best minds were put on this project to solve this hack, and Mitchell outshined them all. Ladies and gentlemen, Mitchell Ramon. On the other side of the stage, Bray's jaw drops. Jada sits there motionless this isn't real this is a joke he's playing some messed up joke on us right hugo nudges mitchell forward and mitchell begins to speak when i was 16 years old i watched my mother spiral into depression drug addiction and then ultimately schizophrenia I saw the woman who raised me deteriorate right before my eyes. I put my passion for creating new technologies and my admission into my dream school, Yale University, aside for her. I took care of her for six years, putting her needs before my own. But then a year ago, my life changed. My mother passed away. I got a job at Pell and I refound my love for programming. I would stay up late every night creating new inventions. I programmed and coded until my fingers bled. I did, I did it all because I knew that, that one day I would be able to stand here and present my greatest achievement to the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Lotus. This tiny drive is the solution to almost every single computer problem known to man. It will cure the super virus. And with slight modifications over the years, it will cure many more viruses to come. Thank you to Pell Industries for giving me the opportunity to share my invention with the world. Lights out on Mitchell. Lights back up on Jada and Bray. Bray gets up and walks toward the door. Uh, I'll go get us some waters from the vending machines. Jay, I need air. I'll be back. Jada doesn't respond. She just sits there. Bray watches her sister for a moment, then heads out the door. Jada smashes a mirror on the wall next to her. She picks up one of the large shards of glass and holds it near her wrist, but does not cut. She throws the glass away from herself. I'll not be like my mother. There's a perfectly good explanation. She rewinds the TV. Mitchell's side of the stage is now dark, but we hear Hugo's line again. Ladies and gentlemen, be prepared to never forget the name Mitchell Ramon. Lights out.